Hello, welcome back to Up the Villa. This is our match preview for Fulham v Aston Villa. The international break is over and we've got Aston Villa back in action. Ryan, how are you doing? All the better now that international break is over. That was a long one, man. It's sort of, <laughs> there's not been a lot going on. So, yeah, glad to be uh, looking forward to uh, an Aston Villa match day, mate. Yeah, I mean, it got slightly better when Watkins came on. Ran that channel, got the ball, won us the free kick, sort of. Then he assists Rice. Dixon blames Watkins for not tracking the runner, although it was nothing to do with Watkins. So the international break ended on a bit of anger for me because I was just that frustrated with Lee Dixon. But uh, right, we can get back involved in Villa then. To me, Ryan, this feels like a bit of a part of our season where it's very important and I think a fluid Villa that is sort of getting the job done but playing well and showing our full capabilities in this period so it can mirror sort of last season when we were really good in November, December, should give us added impetus and confidence to have a real good season for me personally I think we've been good I think we've evolved slightly I think we're a bit of a different team I think we can find a way and I think we are more tactically astute rather than being as dynamic but I think I do want to merge the two together so we'll get the fixtures up in a second but how are you feeling now because we've got another international break in November and I think it's weird this time of the year, isn't it? Because it's sort of bulk of games, international break, bulk of games, international break. It's hard to get going at times, but it, this bit does feel quite important to me. Yeah, it's like um, staggered the momentum, hasn't it? The, the international breaks with the, the Nations League. Um, I do agree. It's an important period now up to November. Um, and then just after that as well, probably probably up to the first of the December, after that Chelsea game, I think we're going to know exactly where we are, uh, what type of team we are. And it's, it's a big it's a big period for us now. Like you say, last season, between September and December, we played some excellent football. Probably some of the best football that I've seen following Aston Villa. It was, it was sensational at times. And that was coupled with European trips uh, in the Conference League. Now, we've got Champions League games and we've got... Carabao Cup games in, in this period. Um, I feel like the Champions League now is going to get real demanding. Um, I think we've had the opener away. Uh, the big build-up to that, just being in the Champions League, the excitement. We got past that first game. We won that first game. Brilliant. Then we had the opener at Villa Park. We all got to, to witness that performance against Bayern and, and it, it felt like a cup final vibe. But I feel now... A lot of the demanding games. Champions League is becoming the norm. The fixtures are the norm. It's like Bologna next, followed by Club Bruges. And, and they're not as glamorous, shall we say, but they could be even tougher because the, the, the initial excitement isn't there, is it? Now it's more demanding fixtures. Um, so I feel like that, coupled with the Premier League, have we adjusted to Premier League and Champions League football? Yeah, we've done okay. Like... The first game, we had Wolves and we had Everton, wasn't it? So it was a tough battle, but we found a way. We found a way to get three points in them. And then the buying game was sandwiched between two draws against Ipswich and Manchester United, where that Ipswich one was a bit of like pre-cup final fixture. And then the and then the Bayern one was like, I don't know, a bit of an emotional outpouring. And that, that's what I was saying in the season preview. That's what I want to see us manage. I think physically we can manage pictures it's like that emotional energy like you know we was like buzzing like after that buying game Thursday Friday I was still on cloud nine when I was Luke I was like, absolutely buzzing so God knows what the players come down was like and I, I, we, we did feel that a bit in the Manchester United game now looking back so um but we're learning we're learning on the job now like we, we, we have been under Emery and we are in a position of good experience now to tackle to tackle these to tackle these next round of fixtures. Yeah, so the fixtures that are coming up are quite mixed, and I know 
you have to take one game at a time. But as football fans, it's okay to look past that next game. I think that's why we are the fans. Emery's job is to keep them grounded and one game at a time. So we've got Fulham away. We've got Bologna at home. And then we've got sort of like three home games, which I kind of like these. You know, when you go to a game, you're like, I've got another game in, in a couple of days. And you're like, I've got another game in a couple of days. So I actually really like when we've got like, consecutive games at home. So we've got Bologna Champions League, Bournemouth Premier League, Palace Carabao Cup. Then we've got a pretty big game. It's Spurs away, Bruges away, Liverpool away. So we've kind of got an away game, three at home, three away. Now those aways uh, are difficult, aren't they? You know, you go into two very good Premier League teams and the Bruges game is going to be difficult in there as well. So, yeah, it feels quite big, this does, when I look at these games. That's why I sort of brought it up to start with, to preview, like, the next run of fixtures, because there's a, there's a bit of everything in there, isn't there, really? Yeah, there's a good variety. And, and, and that's that's what we want, isn't it? That's what, you know, last, yeah, that's what every successful team wants. And, you know, Manchester City's, your Liverpool's, your Chelsea's, um, they all... Do they, they compete in all these competitions season in, season out, season in, season out? And, and this is what we need to get used to as a fan base and a squad trying to compete, having stacked out fixture list and like playing three games a week. You know, look at look at the end of that. You know, we've got Tottenham away, Bruges away, Liverpool away within six days. You know, that is relentless. So, um, but it's what we want as football fans, and I'm very much looking forward to it. Yeah, so Fulham's up next away, and we've got a lot to thank them for. We, we've we got a lot to <laughs> thank them boys for down there. We've got um, Gerard. we've got uh, the playoff, the playoff. Oh, you know, we've got, we've got quite a lot to thank them for, and going into this one, we're going into this with a bit of like clean slate. We don't need them at the minute, so it's going to be interesting to see what happens in this game. But um, what have you made of Fulham? Because... They're flying high in the Premier League. Very much so. Very much so. I feel like we're in for a, a real tough game. Um, we got a cracking result there last season, 2-1. Um, um, I was at, actually at that Gerrard final nail in the coffin <laughs> game, and that, and that was disastrous. But since then, we've beaten three times. And, um, yeah, we do, do, we're doing really well with them under Emery. But Marco Silva's got them playing really well. I feel like defensively, they're very disciplined, and, and that enables them to attack fluidly um i've been i've caught a couple of the games the opening game against united and the newcastle game which was which was very good and what i like about them mainly the wide areas they've got lots of rotations i feel like they've got triangles in each in uh, on each width and it's very dangerous and and what i mean by triangles is you've got your left back you, you got your winger and you've got your number eight and they move around and they're so dangerous they create overlaps they create underlaps they create two V1s. So it's very difficult to defend against. And then they've got Raul Jimenez up front, who's like hit a purple patch. Um, you're sort of seeing that Jimenez that was up Wolverhampton Wanderers and bagging, bagging all the goals. So after his injury, it is quite good to see him doing well. But defensively, very strong. They brought Anderson in, who, who I've always liked back from his Crystal Palace days. And I think Palace are struggling because because he's gone as well. And with Fulham, they've evolved a bit as well. They, Polinia, um, he left, like he had the most tackles in the last two seasons, more than anybody. So, you know, you're replacing him out of your midfield. But Silver's sort of like, um, he's made them more progressive in midfield. So he brought Smith Rowe in, which I thought was an excellent signing. He's got Pereira there. So then to form them rotations and then they've got Sasa Lukic who will sit there and defend and defensively solid two two strong centre backs and an experienced goalkeeper and, and when they build that goalkeeper will join in with, with the building so expect to see three of them passing it out from the back so we're in for a, a very very tough game tactically um yeah very much looking forward to it there's there's a lot to like about Fulham at the minute they do they're doing really well and um you know these sort of Premier League teams should get some focus because, you know, what Silver's doing is, is really good and, and they're really interesting. And um, you don't hear a lot about them, do you? 
But, you know, the more you watch them, the more you can appreciate the, the job he's actually doing. It. And it's sort of like, it's not too dissimilar from the way Emery's building Villa. Like, you know, they're going under the radar like we went under the radar. Yeah, well, I don't think I need to predict predicted line up tomorrow now. I think you've uh, smashed it, mate. <laughs> but uh, no, you, uh, a lot you've, well, everything that you've said spot on, to be fair. I've spent the day analysing them today, ready for the episode that will be out tomorrow. And yeah, what I was finding was was a lot of good stuff. The, the way that they play, they that that they when you when you're sort of saying that no one's really talking about them, I, I get a real sense of it's quite fun to play for them at the minute. I think the players are really enjoying playing. I think there's a lot of creative wingers slash number 10 slash eights that can just play in all these different positions. And there's that license for them to sort of express themselves when you're talking about left back, Iwobi on the left as well. They're sort of like cutting in, underlapping, overlapping. Um, it's it's really dynamic and, and they're doing really well. And I think, I think Fulham, it's kind of good to see them playing well because I think teams like Fulham, sometimes they'll have seasons where they finish like 13th, 14th. And you're sometimes thinking, what what are they trying to do here? Like, Are they, is it, are they just trying to survive or are they trying to push and, and, and try and get into Europe? And I, and I think this season there, he's kind of got a bit more of a attacking formula. I think they were quite good last year. I think they they was in and around this area at times last season, but I think they just quite didn't have that whole chemistry within the team. And I think now they've got that. They've got more balance, I think. Um, you know, they can play progressive. They can play counter-attacking. They do like to keep a bit of the ball as well. Traore is still running. Like, he's, he's still running. Uh, he's <laughs> running against Man City and... It, uh, is it a bit of a worry that, that, yeah, but the thing is, is it a bit of a worry now that after that game, when Pep was talking to him about his finishing, he's playing Villa next. What has Pep told him? What was he telling him? Was he, was he telling him to put it in bottom corner or take his time or what has he told him to do? Because I'll be very frustrated if he scores and does really well, because I think it'll be Pep's words, but no, they are doing really well. And I think, it's going to be a really difficult game. Like I cannot reiterate how difficult this game is going to be. And I think they're very strong at home. I think a lot of Premier League teams are pretty strong at home anyway. And for Villa to win this game, we're going to have to play really well. We're going to have to defend really well. We're going to have to control the game well. We're going to have to you know, pick our moments. And, and I think it is going to be really, really difficult. But I think what probably a lot of Villa fans will be saying about this game is that if we want to get top four, again, we have to be getting something from this game, I think. I think that's probably where I'm at. I'm not saying that this is a, a must win. We have to win this game. But I think to keep going unbeaten away from home is going to be really good for us. So I think... Uh, a point would be pretty, pretty good with the way in which that they are playing as well. So I'll go through some of the stats and then we've got a nice little feature coming up as well. So we've got head to head record, which isn't, that's not that bad actually compared to what it's like with some of the teams, 14 Villa wins. We've got four away wins. They've got six home wins. Recent games, we've got a 2-1 Villa, a 3-1 Villa, a 1-0 Villa. A 3 0 loss, which we don't really need to talk about. And then we've got a 3 1 victory on the 4th of April. This season, they're eighth, we're fifth. We've won four, they've won three. We've lost one, they've lost two. Average goals scored per match for Villa is at 1.7, 1.4 for Fulham. They're averagely conceding 1.1, and we're conceding 1.3. I think Villa have got to get that number down a little bit as well. Recent form guide, Villa unbeaten in the last five. They had a loss to Manchester City, but they did play really well in that game. Here is a really good graphic from Opta, and it shows the two different teams in style. So Fulham are really close to the centre. So that basically shows that they've got a medium direct speed. They're edging into that sort of slow and intricate phase. Like I said earlier, they're averaging a bit more possession this season. So they're going to edge towards that. Villa have got a passing sequence of just under four. And we are in that slow and intricate phase. Last season, we were a bit like Fulham slap bang in the middle. So we are getting into that more 
possession-based territory. We are edging more that way. Last season, we were actually like right in the middle. So you can see a little bit of a uh, a different evolution we feel of this season. Here we've got the average possession then for Fulham. They're averaging 49.21% possession. Uh, their last game, they played with a five at the back against Manchester City, which was very, very brave uh, because it was Sander Berg that was making up a back three with Bassi and Anderson. Iwobi was actively acting as a wing back and they were really brave um, at Man City and they played really well. And then in their last game before that, they played a four at the back, which is something that we can expect to see against Aston Villa. But we'll go into that in more detail on the predicted lineup tomorrow. They have scored 10 goals. Their XG is 10.93 and they're at 0.93 deficit. So uh, they're pretty much where they are chances to goals ratio. And then they are conceding three goals from set pieces. And that is an area where I feel like they are a little bit shaky. With all that said, Ryan, do you want to add anything? Um, no, I think you've covered it quite well there. <laughs> the stats don't lie, do they? The stats don't lie. We're in for a, we're in for a, we're in for a tough fixture. I will, I will say, defensively, they are very um, very active when they lose the ball, counter pressing on you. Like that's that's another thing we've we've got to be we've got to be sharp on, especially the way we build from the back. So, yeah, intriguing fixture this is going to be, mate. Tough one, but intriguing. So the thumbnail leads me on to the next conversation: Luca Dean and Robinson, two left backs, and during the international break, Opta again released this article about left backs and about progressive left backs and how teams utilise and use their left-backs. And the graphic that we've got now is a comparison between every Premier League team's left-back. So Villa are pretty high for the height in which our left-back takes upon the ball. So we've got Aston Villa at 58.3. We've got Newcastle at 58.5. Tottenham are at 59.9, so a dodgy going into those really attacking areas centrally. Um, and I just thought this was really interesting. And what it also shows is the differentials between your left back and your right back. So our left back is going more attacking. And we can see the differential between our right back. So our right back is at 53.7. Fulham are at 54.9 and their right back, Tete, is at 55.7. So they've got a little bit more balance to theirs. But I really wanted to touch on both players, really, Ryan, and get your thoughts on Luke Dean and Robinson, because I think Robinson got a great name. But I think <laughs> he's very, yeah, he's underrated. He's really underrated in the Premier League. He's, he's got a lot of ability, a lot of skill. I think he, he's venturing into attacking areas. I think he's got a good technical brain with him as well. I think because the link up between him and Awobi on that left hand side is really clever. And I think he uses his opportunity to attack really well. He's not just a left back that just keeps bombing on and bombing on. He, he senses when to go. And I think he's a really good player. His delivery is really good. Um, and I just I, I enjoy watching him. I think whenever I watch him play, he, he always plays really well, and I think he really suits this system. So yeah, Robinson and, and Dinier. Yeah, Robinson. He's got sort of that socks down vibe, hasn't he? As well, that you know, on the eye makes him makes him look like a, a tasty baller, doesn't it? And um, yeah, again, I've been impressed with him. Like you touched on there, he's linked up with Wobi and also uh, he's linked up with um, Smith Rowe as well. It's been excellent. Them three as a trio, really, really dangerous. And it's something our right side uh, will need to be very aware of. Um, but yeah, as for, as for Luca Dina and the left back position, like left backs now, like it's just a real technical position now, isn't it? You know, you, you, you're overlapping, you're underlapping, you, you need technical ability to, to play on the ball, step into midfield. There's so many different variations of fullbacks and how people how people use them. Like like you look at um, Rico Lewis for Manchester City, like he pushes up into like the number 10 position. Like it's 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 crazy how how 
people utilize their their fullbacks. But but for us. Luca Dean, Matson, the left back position is key. It's a key position. And like after the game, I like to analyse players and, and see their contributions in the game. And I, I was looking today at, at Luca Dean. And so I'm looking at a left back. What, what am I looking for? Probably first thing crosses into the penalty area, the classic ball back putting the crosses in. So Luca Dean, first place, you know, he's six balls into the penalty area. The next in our squad is Leon Bailey on two. So you can see the amount uh, that Luca Dean is putting in there. Robinson, similar sort of stats and um, squad um, highest amounts for, for Fulham as well. And then you're looking at defensive uh, contributions in the game, tackles, Luca Dean has made 20, his first place. <laughs> Interceptions, he's made nine, first place. Blocks, seven, his first place again. So all, all them defensive attributes he, he, he's top at. Like, so that just shows his involvement in the game. Like his tackles, half of them, well, nearly half of them are in the midfield area and the final third. So it, it, there you get like a sense of his positioning and where, and where, he's, where he's winning the ball and, and our like sort of high line. And, you know, you, get, you, you sort of get where, where he is on the pitch. And, um, and then... Look, with Luca Dean, I wouldn't probably look at his progressive carrying, but I'd look at where he's like receiving the ball. So you can look at the stats for receiving progressive balls. And where is he, mate? Where is he? He's in, he's in that top five. He, you know, he's only behind Rogers, Watkins, Ramsey, and Bailey. And then we're looking at shots and goal creations. We touched on this in, in the last episode that me and you did together. And um, you're looking at his pre-assists. Um, he has got two. Ian Matson's got three. So them two combined, it, it's top. It's squad top of the list again. Uh, his shot creations, Matson's got 12. Luca Dean's got eight. So between them, they've got 20. And that's the third highest in, in the squad. So you can see... The importance of Luca Dean and the left back position, and Ian Matson, he, his contributions as well that he's made when he's come on. So it, it really is a focus of of our game, really, isn't it? It's um, it's a, it's a big position for the Unai Emery system. Are you telling me kids growing up now are going to uh, wanting to be left backs then? Oh yeah, oh, yeah personally, yeah. Because <laughs> before, what what was a left back? It was like the kid that weren't fast enough to play a winger or weren't good enough to be centre back. It was just that like funny position that you, all you'd be doing is marking the winger, and not really, yeah. not really bombing forward or something like that. It was a boring position to be honest back <laughs> in the day. But now it's a very, very attractive, a very attractive position. Yeah, or left back in the changing room. That that's <laughs> exactly, another one. Isn't yeah. It? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So left side of Villa is very, very good. And then next topic we were going to talk about was our right hand side and Leon Bailey. And I was going into this episode sort of going, okay, now not Phil Jean, two games under his belt. Boom. Phil Jean injured under 21s, had a scan, not as worse as first feared. Doubt for the Fulham game. It's like, oh, what, what is going on? Why are they even going there in the first place? It's pathetic. Anyway, so we're still going to touch about the right side. Any of you that missed our episode that we touched on Villa season so far, you would have seen this graphic. If you've not seen this graphic, this is Aston Villa's average positions and passing networks over the first seven league matches. Now, what you can see is on the left-hand side, there's Luca Dean, there's Ramsey, there's Yuri Tielemans, and on the right-hand side, it's breaking down a little bit. Now, it's breaking down a little bit because of the rotation that we've had. So, Bailey's been in there, McGinn's been in there, Philogene's been in there, Philogene's going a little bit more central because he's doing more defensive work in the last two games. But I just want to get your thoughts on Leon Bailey, Ryan, because personally, I'm very, very calm about it. I'm very much like I sense that he's not 100% and he's been playing not at 100%. And we know that there's a player there from last season that's going to get better. And once he's backfiring, then he'll be absolutely flourishing because the game against Bayern Munich 
that there was something wrong with him because he was training on his own with a coach, having a little test before the game. Now, are no one else trains like that before a game. So that shows to me that that was a little bit of a fitness test. And, you know, he played a bit and he came off again. And then he played against Man United. And I just think he's just, just getting back to that level. And, and I think there's no panic from me because we know the full capabilities of what the player can do in that position. Where are you sort of at with this right-hand side? Yeah, it's just been disrupted all season, hasn't it? And I, I agree with you. I, I think uh, Bailey is carrying or he's managing an injury, um, playing through the pain barrier. Um, with his performances, I feel like he's hesitant. Um, mm. Is that because he's not 100% and he doesn't feel 100% for me? By, uh, Bailey, like uh, Watkins, I feel like they... Like that type of plan is to be a hundred percent clear in his mind. Now, if you're carrying a knock, sometimes you see Bailey cut inside and go, and go to ping one, and it, and it feels like he's got that hesitancy about him. It, it, you know, is he going to hit a shot and feel like he's going to pull something, or you know, it, it, is that on his mind? And and I feel like that's a cause for this right hand side. And and then you look, well, look how we started the season. We started the season with two two centre backs, and then we started with Cash and Luca Dean. And they were both progressive this season. They were both going down the wings. We had the box sort of midfield of the two centre-backs and Anana and Tillemans. And that's how we build with the four and then the two. And then they'll join and we'd have a front five, front six in attack. And that's how we, we started the season progressively. Now, Cash goes down injured, second game. Uh, Bogart comes in, doesn't he? Sort of tries to replicate the cash role moving forward. We weren't quite working, took back in a bit. Then we ended up going Conza and we sort of resorted back to how we ended the season last season, how we were building last season. Uh, cash now has come back. So we're, we're looking at being progressive on the wings again. So I do think there was a bit of a stall change from last season to the start of this season, but then we've had to resort back because of an injury on the right-hand side. Now, there's no consistency on that right. You know, Cash, Bogard, Nadalkovic has played. That's three full-backs that play Premier League minutes. You've got Bailey, you've got Jaden. You've got McGinn who's gone out there. All of them have been on the injury list. And it's just, we can't get any consistency or momentum going. And, you know, we talk about Fulham. They, they are really balanced because they've had, they've pretty much had the whole squad available to them. And I think once we can sort of get through this patch of injuries, we can't seem to get a fully healthy squad, can we? I think it's coming. Feels like it's coming, but then all of a sudden, a knock here, a knock there, a knock there. Mm. We're missing them. Two will go out at a time. We never normally seem. To, we never normally only have like one man on the, on the injury bench or whatever. It's always three or four. So I just feel a fully fit squad, and I feel like that pass map will start to be more balanced. You'll start to see more mm. rotation over there because we are left sided heavy. Luca Dean likes to go forward. Tillemans, our most creative player. Is on that side. Ramsey, Watkins prefers it out on that left. You've seen his run for England the other night. It comes from that side. Obviously, then Rogers is going to gravitate to where all the action's at as well. So it is it is left-sided heavy. And, and I think Emery will know that, that we we do need to get the right back up and firing because if it's that heavy on the left-hand side and everyone can see it, we're becoming very predictable then. And we, yeah, we, we need to... To, to lose that tag of predictability that I felt like we had at the end of last season. And I felt the change at the start of the season, the way we were building and progressing, it, it felt different. And, 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 it could, and it could give us that unpredictability where we've got options. And uh, it's just, if we can get the guys fit, there is plenty of options and, and, and how the defence will shape up, especially with Mings coming back into it. Kamara will be on that right-hand side as well. So, again, that, that type of creativity, that, that baller from out the back will, will will force us over to that side and be more balanced. So, it, I, I do, I'm do i calm about it because we're still getting results, but you don't want it to prolong so long where we do become predictable and, and teams start hurting, hurting us because of it. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think we just got to get some of these lads fit. Come on, boys. Get off yeah, that you, the table. You are right, especially on that right-hand side, because it's kind of like analysing a goal, isn't it? Because 
if you just point your finger at, say, the last player that was ever involved in that moment and not go back and look at, you should have stopped the cross, then go back and think, if you'd have won that tackle, if we'd have pressed more as a team and analysed the goal like that, it's kind of a little bit like this with our right-hand side, isn't it? Because if you're thinking about who's behind Bailey, you know, if it's Bogard, if it's the disruption with Conser or it's Carlos and, and all these different little permutations, then you are probably going to have these little bit of little problems, especially on that right-hand side. But I feel like you've been looking at my notes, Ryan, because I was going to talk next about like players coming back. So go on, what were you going to say? Just to, to continue on your point there, that the Ipswich goal, the second one, was was a prime example of, of our right-hand side breaking down because... Yes, Carlos got flat-footed, lost his body, his shape, his weight distribution went and 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 Delap put it in. But prior to that, you know, Conza's advancing up the pitch. He's got Jaden. He tries a, the world-class pass to Watkins. That breaks down. So Conza's out of position. Anano is not quite up to speed on the Envy system, was caught out of position. Ball goes over the top and and, Con, uh, and Carlos is backtracking one-on-one. -on -one. And, you know, a lot. Carlos got a lot of stick for that goal. And... You know, it, it was poor from Carlos, but like you say, what happened prior to that, and and that was a complete breakdown of like players not in position, players new to the system, and, and stuff like that. So, I, I do I think that goal happens if it's a Kamara, a Bailey, a Cashin? Probably not. Probably we wouldn't be caught out as much as we did. So. It, 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 you know, we're, we're getting some learning curves in, in them positions and, and we're, we're still growing, but um, yeah, it will, it, it will come together that right side. And not you, I'm calm about it. Yeah, definitely. So, players that apparently are going to be back ready in a squad are Kamara and Mings. He said after the international break that they'll be involved. So, I imagine Kamara definitely, or hopefully, definitely. Oh, Nane mentioned being back. Ramsey, McGinn, Konsa was only going to be out for around two weeks. So I imagine he might be touch and go whether he's ready or not. I did go to watch the under-21s against Newcastle and I watched Kamara and he was very, very good. Um, his positional awareness was great. Reading of the game was brilliant. His passing range was really good. He was chatting to the younger lads, nurturing them through the game. He had a real standout sort of performance where I was watching him thinking, he, he's, he's, he's ready now, he's. Um, he needs match sharpness, I think. That would what I'd probably say. Like He was covering the ground really well, getting about the pitch well, but I did kind of feel like, you know, he hadn't had a pre-season, has he? So he... He's probably going to take a bit of time. I imagine 20 minutes, 15 minutes, 10 minutes here and there, and he'll start to get up and running. He's been training with the first team for quite a while now, so he is pretty fit, but I think he needs to be match fit. When I watched Mings as well, he was really good. I didn't see any problems with Mings. He was turning well. His recovery was good, winning everything in the air. His passing range, he played two lovely crossfield balls to Brogio. Um, and he, he was really good. So both of them look good. Um, if anyone's not listened to Mings' interview with Ben Foster on Fozcast, I think it's called, go and check it out because it talks about his rehabilitation, about him having that sort of second surgery around October time. And he mentioned that he was getting Villa fans saying stuff like, oh, you you must only be about three, three and four months away from your recovery. And he said on there, he was thinking, I haven't even started it yet. He, and, you know, he was that far behind. He was saying like, oh, I've got, I've got to start my rehabilitation now. And this was like in, in and around November time. So, you know, it shows what he's been through. Um, so, yeah, if he can be back, brilliant. But like, what you're saying about, these issues on this right-hand side. I think a lot of people, potentially not Villa fans, don't realise what Kamara is to Villa. Like Kamara is our Rodri. It, that is our equivalent to Rodri. He's, he's in, as important as what Rodri is to Man City and Kamara is that for Aston Villa. And again, it goes under the radar of 
us getting Champions League football, playing without Kamara for around four whole months last year, is, is remarkable of what we did. And, and this player coming into our team is just going to offer so much for our system to screen that back three, his recoveries, his protection, his reading of the game, those little, when he dangles that leg and scoops the ball and can drive a little bit and just knowing that that next player in that double pivot has got that little bit of protection. I think it's just going to elevate our midfield again. And I think players like Onana will, will start to go up another level, I think. I think when Onana signed, I spoke about that the Everton Onana wasn't the one we've got. And he has been playing in that position for Villa at the minute. But I see him playing a little bit further forward. And I think he can play on that sort of next side to a Kamara. And then you can move a Tielemans around or, you know, that versatile option of different players moving into different positions and having more depth in there. So, yeah, I just really want to reiterate how important and how big it is having Kamara back in this team. I mean, I know you really like him, Ryan, anyway, but... Yeah, he's massive for us. Yeah, he is massive. And he was a Champions League player when we signed him. And now he's returning from injury, back playing Champions League, won't he? Because he is that good. <laughs> he really looks, like you say, he's like the Rodri to Manchester City. And, you know, they're starting to show cracks already. You know, it's only Haaland's goals that are, are masking that. But as soon as they draw a couple or lose one, you know what the headlines are going to be. Rodri this, Rodri that, Rodri this. And, and, for us, you know, for, you just got to give massive credit to Unai Emery again, is it? Because he finds ways to deal with these blows, the no excuse culture, and to lose a player of Kamara's ability and and game intelligence. I think that's one of the main things we've we've, we've missed about Kamara is his, his intelligence um, playing playing the game, his his anticipation, his reading of the game. You know, that's something we've mass missively. You know, when you talk about the right side, the screening that he does there when, when players bump forward, he's just um, another level, Kamara. And it feels like a new signing, doesn't it, mate? It feels like we've, that there's going to be a, a freshness to the squad by reintroducing both Kamara and um, and Mings back to, the, back to the team. And, it, yeah, it feels like two new summer signings. And... Um, it's, it's healthy for the squad and, and it gives us plenty of options. You know, it gives us more options defensively. If we can get Mings back back in the, in the squad, you know, could he play central and, and power a bit more left? And there's, there's there's quite a lot of options that we can do then. We, we, you know, we could even have the option to play four centre-backs if we wanted in, in some games. Um, and then Kamara back as well. It just gives us um, more options, doesn't it? You know, you could sort of like pick the Villa eleven quite easily at the minute this 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 first five six seven games but when you start getting more options game by game we, we could really change it up it's like you saying like um Tillemans could go up in next to next to Watkins couldn't they and, and, and Nana could be that box to box and I do I, I, I am on the same wavelength for you where I feel that Nana could be a box crasher do you know what I mean tearing into, yeah. into the box um there is that option. So I think it all stems back to, to getting players fully fit and that would really, really help Aston Villa. So, uh, yeah, the more the merrier. Yeah, I mean, I, I won't get a touch on Onana, but I, I think from watching Onana, I don't think his best attributes are, are in that deep line position. I don't, I just don't think it's his position. I, I, I think I, I want to see him a bit further forward and, and breaking through lines. And like you say, driving and getting on the end of stuff and being more combative there. And I think we all know, and we've touched on that, how important Kamara is. But what Kamara does, that is a real specialised position. And when Emery rocked up at Villa, he just got the perfect player to just sit in there and do it. He, he, he hadn't got to nurture and coach him too much. He was just literally like, you can play there and that's what he does and, and that's how good he is. So, yeah, a stacks out episode, nearly 40 minutes. So we'll go score predictions then. Um, ooh, I'm going to go... I'm going to go... I'm going to go... 2-1 Villa. I think, we, I think it's the same as last season. I think it's the same as last season. What are you going with? 
I'm torn, mate. I'm torn. I'm torn in my head and my heart. My heart saying two one, same as you. <laughs> head saying one one. Um, you've always you've always got to go with your heart, ain't you, mate? So let's uh, let's go for it for a two one. Love it, mate. Right. So next up, we've got predicted lineup, and then we've got usual content coming out throughout the week. Actually, got to do something. Actually, so basically, hold on. Before I forget, right, I got sent this picture from manofthematch.com and it is from the Bayern Munich game. So it's got the team, it's got the scorers. Um, so, yeah, they've kindly sent me this. So if any of you want to go and check it out, I've got a code here of 15% off uh, and it is MOTM15. Uh, so you can use that code, fifteen percent off off that order for that picture. They have got some other Villa stuff on there as well. So go and check the website out, have a look. Um, so yeah, up the Villa, up the Villa. 